So we are live on the stream. And video and sound is all hot now. So everyone can hear me, me having this conversation, but they can't hear <laughs> your answers. <laughs> Great. Uh, wow, Scott, cool. I can't Ooh. believe you said that. <laughs> wow, Scott, that violates Twitch's terms. Can I get a little less gain in my mic? It's kind of hot for me. Uh, me thank too. You. Hot. You don't like to hear yourself in the back of the room? On, I don't like to hear myself come back. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the room, come back. They're in back again. Maybe come back. That's when I get nervous that, like, I'm yelling and... I'm always uh, yelling. That's my secret. That's, I'm always that's my yelling. Secret. Yeah, exactly. That's my secret cap. I'm always yelling. Uh, I have to be careful. So I'm voice just going to pull so up. I project too much sometimes. So. Uh, I'm just yeah. obnoxiously loud. <laughs> yeah. Especially when I laugh. Like, I'm glad I'm not laughing. No, God, no. We yeah. have been using but that quote like, and just changing like the adjective. Uh, because exactly. I do all, all of our audio editing, I'm super aware of like, there we go. what Chat am I going to fix this yeah. later? Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. I record everything too low. <laughs> because I can fix too low, I can't fix too high. Yeah, when you start clipping. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. That's my secret to audio. Yes, <laughs> honestly, that's, yeah. I'm yep. not an audio person, but if I record it low enough, at least it won't clip. Yep. I'm now remarkably self-conscious about my breathing. Especially <laughs> when I'm so sorry. I'm just like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay. That is 100% my fault. It's like you're giving a deposition. It's this, I'm talking. <laughs> 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 Uh, just for the folks that are on the stream right now, we are about four minutes to go time. Also, the folks in the room, uh, we got about four minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, but the folks on the stream specifically, I will be watching the chat to uh, pass questions between the room and the chat uh, just to make sure that everybody gets uh, gets the questions they have answered. And for the folks in the room, uh, that channel is DC Digital Media on Twitch. Uh, after the con, every panel that was in this room will be available video on demand for 14 days, and then it'll go up onto the YouTube channel, uh, DC Digital Media, Dragon Con Digital Media Track. It's got a name. If you Google those things <laughs> plus YouTube, you'll find it. Hey, if I, you follow us, I bet we'll post about it. Oh, I guarantee Probably. I will. <laughs> There's been a poster to it. Sweet. Yeah. So it's DC Digital Media on YouTube, uh, DC Digital Media on Twitch. Um, and on Instagram. It, yeah. Instagram has Instagram a much longer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got more letters than I've ever seen. Uh, like, just in general. Yeah, 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 yeah. Non Euclidean letters. Uh, <laughs> Shout out uh, to Tyre Burton, though. Yes. Oh, all my God. Media Queen and has so yeah. much the past two weeks. She has. <laughs> yeah, been nonstop posting and it's amazing. All those images and everything mm -hmm. was just incredible. Throwing yeah. things yeah. together, just like, oh, you don't have a panel promo? Here you go. Yeah. Yep. Look, uh, I did 40 amazing. of them. Mm -hmm. no, I feel silly for making my own. <laughs> <laughs> I guarantee she appreciates it. Yeah. Uh, so before we get officially started here, I am going to run through some housekeeping. Uh, I want to make sure that we call out that this year's official uh, charity for Dragon Con is Open Hands. Uh, Open Hands' mission is to help underserved individuals prevent or better manage chronic disease through tailored nutrition interventions. Super important work. Uh, your diet is like so much of uh, what you do, and managing disease and nutrition at the same time can be super tricky. And so uh, they, they have a really, really noble cause. Uh, and Dragon Con is matching up to $100,000 that gets donated this, this weekend. So uh, let's make sure to drop in uh, at whatever you've got in the bucket. Uh, we'll take watches, we'll take uh, iPhones, uh, you know, 13 <laughs> and uh, better. Uh, we're not picky. Wow, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, no, but honestly, uh, your old crap. yeah, exactly. Put, put valuables in the bucket, uh, go on the internet and put valuables in the online digital bucket uh, and let's just fill it all up uh, because like, the thing that I love most about Dragon Con is the community. Uh, Jenny, come on up, man. <laughs> yeah, no. And here I thought I was early. You are. Yeah, we you still that. are. Uh, I'm vamping, man. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a whole minute left on the clock. That's right. 
Uh, and now we have officially begun. Uh, no. Channing, perfectly on time, and welcome to DragonCon 2022, Sunday at 5.30. Uh, if you are here in the room, if you are on the stream, I'm so happy you made it. If you are watching video on demand, I'm happy you're here uh, late. Uh, but you know what? Next year, uh, you can be here live during the action as well. Um, my name is Mike Craniola. I am a podcaster, Twitch streamer, um, day job haver, and soccer fan. Uh, and I wanted to introduce myself to you all as the moderator of today's panel, uh, Finding Your Niche, Creating For You. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to talk about across here with our panelists is just uh, one at a time, you say the word N-I-C-H-E. Uh, and uh, because we're going to hear it a few different ways, I think. Uh, I, I say niche. I say niche. I'm undecided. I just posted a TikTok asking my followers <laughs> this last week. <laughs> what did they say? <laughs> they said niche. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Niche. Team niche. All right. Well, well I, I am outnumbered. Uh, Jason's followers that said niche. <laughs> I got you. Uh, I'm going to hold it down for the underdog here uh, all day. Uh, everybody else can say what they want. Uh, but what I really want to hear them say is who they are, what they do, and what sets them apart from others in the space. We're going to give everybody a couple of minutes here because we've got kind of uh, a few of us. Uh, and so I'll start real quick. Uh, my name is Mike Craniola. I do podcasts on Twitch. And uh, one of the shows that I do is called Swoon Tower Soccer. Uh, it is a soccer podcast mixed with Tiger Beat uh, because a lot of soccer podcasts in America uh, try to legitimize the sport for sports fans. And I am trying to legit legitimize the players uh, for people fans. <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> how do I follow that up? <laughs> My name's Chris. I run the, we'll, we'll start with the YouTube channel. I run the YouTube channel, Currency Fabrications. My primary niche is 3D printing, and I'm in the, sort of a transition period where I'm trying to transition more to uh, probably my first love, which is just making things. So I'm switching over to maker type projects, cosplay, prop making, that kind of thing. And so I'm, uh, what sets me apart is that I, I'm luckily enough, don't have to do it as my full-time job. And so as I continue to transition, I'm hoping that the people that listen to me and watch my channel will follow me along. And so far, they've been really great at that. Sweet. I am Stephanie Craniola. Um, you can find me online at Krogles. And my general niche show is Protest Too Much, a Shakespeare Showdown podcast. And what sets me apart is... <laughs> That I like to say that I'm a jack of all trades and a master of early modern English literature because that's what my very <laughs> useful master's degree is in. Um, so I'm coming at Shakespeare as an academic and a performer and a director and just a, a lover of reading. And a, like all of these different things are coming together to produce this show that a lot of the content in Shakespeare is very summary based because people need help getting introduced to Shakespeare. So I didn't want to just add on to that. Um, and I also wanted to cultivate my audience in a very specific way where I didn't want the Shakespeare was very, bleh, you know, those kind of people. Um, so it's very stupid. It's chaotic. It's fun. And it shows that Shakespeare can be interesting and exciting and, and relevant now. So kind of just like popped into that space that didn't really have a lot filling it in that world. Excellent. I'm Jason Duro. I'm an epic fantasy author, and I also work as a voiceover artist, and I am very active on TikTok, on BookTok in particular, and the thing that sets me apart there is when I first came to TikTok, it was with the uh, intention of just promoting my writing and selling my books there, and I found a love for uh, helping people to learn how to write better and publish, and to I advocate for self-publishing a lot, and I uh, have sort of formed a big community there around my account, around uh, people helping each other to write and to self-publish, especially in fantasy, but other things as well. So I uh, enjoy helping people, almost kind of mentoring them through TikTok, and uh, have gone in that direction. So I think that's what sets me apart with that account. That's awesome. Uh, hi, I'm Swan, also known as a Swan named Emily across the internet. I am an artist and a Twitch streamer. I came from Comic-Con world and comic book specifically world. So what I wanted to do and what I think sets me apart is I take the 
you coming up to a table, an artist alley table at Comic-Con and watching an artist draw, but I do that live on the internet. And then I collected a whole bunch of my other great artist friends and put together the Doodle Crew where you get to watch all of us tackle a different prompt with a whole bunch of different artists. And I'm also an educator, so I love talking about how to how to do art, how to make art, how to have fun with it, how it can be just a hobby and you don't have to be good at it. And I love that aspect of it. I'm also uh, on Sketching Shakespeare with Steph where we take Shakespeare and I get to illustrate a comic based on it knowing nothing about Shakespeare, uh, which is really fun. So again, I do no work to prep before that and I just draw, which is my favorite thing. Uh, yeah, so I think it's it's very fun being an artist in the digital media space, especially because I'm able to kind of feel that same connective feeling that you get from being behind the artist table at a convention. Ooh, that's going to be some tough action to follow. <laughs> um, I'm Channing Sherman. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the Black Geeks of Dragon Con group. It's a group that focuses on diversity here at Dragon Con. I always tell people it is very much a party and not a protest. Um, I'm soon to be the host of the Smarty Art Brother podcast, which will be launching later this fall. And as far as what makes me different, um, we'll start with the elephant in the room. I am a youngish black man in a field that is dominated by a lot of white men. No offense to anybody else on the panel. <laughs> Take it. But, Can't get but, offended by facts. Yes, that's true. <laughs> that's true. But I think the other thing that kind of makes me unique is that I have a lot of different interests. So my niche is very broad, believe it or not. Cool. I like learning new things from different people. Um, give you Dragon Con, I think I hit at least one program on no less than eight or nine different tracks. Yeah. each year because i, I kind of like that so i think variety is kind of what sets me apart it's awesome uh and also y'all did that so much faster than uh <laughs> i had planned so we're gonna ah like, oh, i'm did, so happy get a no 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 it's good it's good because like now we can bank that time for later for questions from the audience um and so i wanted to kind of jump into a little bit of the 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 pre-gen questions here uh starting with kersey here uh what's the most effective strategy that you found to separate your videos from others like on youtube you know because when i go to youtube i see a lot of kind of like the the little clips or the you know the the title cards that look the same right um so when i started off i I, like I said, I'm in a technical side of YouTube. And so most of my videos, or at least up to this point, have been all about 3D printers or a 3D printer upgrade or something. If you're in the cell phone space or something like that, it would be very similar to I'm reviewing a new Galaxy phone or whatever the case may be. And so what I learned just honestly from trial and error is while you should have some product image in, in that so that they know what they're about to see, having that be your thumbnail, having that be your title isn't enough. And early on, I was real, I was real hesitant to put my face in the thumbnails. After all, no one knew who, who I was sure. personally. And so I'm like, who's going to care if they see my face in a thumbnail? Well, it turns out that number one, you're not going to be new on YouTube forever if you continue <laughs> to make content. So maybe they're going to want to find your older content. And number two, just having a human face associated with your content so that they see that there is a person in this video giving their advice, giving whatever it is. It doesn't have to be technical content, whatever information you're providing. Having a human face associated with that video brings a lot to it and pulls people in. And you'll notice with pretty much every content creator that, I mean, particularly the big ones, their face is always in the thumbnail. And there's a reason for that. And it's not just that people recognize them. It's that a human face will draw them into the content. And hopefully, as you build an audience, people will be drawn in specifically to your face. And you want to set yourself up for that success. That's awesome. Uh, and I've really, I liked learning a bit more in that, that like, uh, from your perspective, it's not about like, oh, an algorithm might be judging my uh, my thumbnail picture, right? Which uh, could be the case. Uh, I don't know enough about YouTube to know. Uh, <laughs> but I do know that the algorithm is something that's really important on TikTok. And so uh, Jason and maybe Steph, uh, depending yeah. on this, right? Uh, this morning, specifically, Jason, in your reading and writing with BookTok mm -hmm. uh, conversation, you mentioned seeing a steady build 
right. on the platform, which uh, is not what I would normally associate with TikTok, right? Usually yeah. I feel like it's like a pop and then like a uh, 100 videos of nothing and then another pop, right? right. Um, right. Is that by design? It is not by design. I've had no pop, so I, I, I keep trying for the pop, and the pop's never there. So, but um, yeah, I, I joined uh, TikTok in late January and had no idea how to do anything with TikTok at that point. I uh, just kind of started learning, and uh, I decided that I wanted to make videos that I was as authentic as possible in it, and uh, went ahead and put my face out there. Uh, a lot of people on TikTok uh, do videos where you're talking to the camera. A lot of them do the uh, more of the trending audio things, which I do those as well, where you make jokes out of. Uh, existing audios, but um, more so I focused on just talking to the camera and giving authentic information and being a valuable resource. And over time, I, I haven't had any videos go truly viral, which that would be like over 100,000 views or whatever. The most I've had on a single video is maybe like 21,000 views. But I've made in that time, like uh, around, I think I'm around 700 videos at this point for this year. And just over Jeez. time, uh, I've uh, gathered a lot of really good engagement in my community and have built a community around that and people who value the information. So I've seen just gradually bit by bit the community growing I'm up to um, I think I'm almost to 9,000 followers at this point so it's just building bit by bit and none of it's been viral it's just been grit and just cranking out those videos cool can I add to that Please. because I think that sometimes as creators uh, you know when I I made I started making TikToks so that I could make I was making book flowers for our wedding and I wasn't going to do it if I wasn't making it content because I can't hold myself <laughs> to doing anything um so I, I wanted something to, you know, explode. I want a viral video. I want to get followers. But I've had that very slow build, and I have a much smaller following, but pretty actively engaged. And those are the people that are actually going to buy your book or actually yeah. going to listen to my podcast. Viral numbers can look amazing and feel, like, really validating, but the the follow-through on that isn't necessarily there. Right. So having that small but engaged community is sometimes more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. Um, Jason, do you play the algorithm as part of your niche? Like, do you lever that at all? I try. I don't let it really direct my content, but I do as far as formatting. Like if I am using hashtags for something or if I'm trying to do something of uh, like how many words to put on the screen or something like that, I'll try to figure that out. But the TikTok algorithm is changing, it seems like, every day. And sure. so it's sort of a crapshoot every time you try. Like you'll try. <laughs> I went for a little while I was using no hashtags and I was getting more engagement with that than using any hashtags. And then suddenly it switched around. Mm -hmm. Now I'm using hashtags again. So you know, it's hard to really know what's going to work from day to day. But as far as that, I do I don't really let the uh, the trends and things direct what I actually talk about and what I present about. I just do whatever I want to talk about, but then I sort of try to format it in the direction that will make the invisible algorithm happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. All hail the algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> or Fear alternately, it. F the algorithm, <laughs> depending. Depending on the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so this next question is for Swan. Uh, I was wondering. As an art streamer, this, what was the streaming landscape like when you started? So it was interesting to me because I am very much a newbie to digital media. Uh, my first Dragon Con was 2019. So I've not been doing this for very long. I have been an artist for a very long time, but new to this part. So I was aware of some artists that I already knew and followed on Instagram and Twitter who streamed. And it seemed like a cool place and it seemed like something interesting. I think the fact that there is a specific channel for it, that is something that you you stream on it so people can search for it. And it's becoming this as Twitch has become more available and more open and more people know it, not just as the video game watching place, but as a place to go and watch something. You know, if you just want to watch people just chatting, you can do that. And it's very much the same for art. And it has been fascinating because it's all facets of art. It's not just someone working on a digital art commission. It's crafters, it's makers, it's people who are doing watercolors or all of these different facets of art. So it is, I think, in my opinion, it has become a very nice place to be because you go to Twitch expecting to see art and you can pretty much find art at any point. So yeah. there is a nice community there. Not necessarily that we are all connected. I mean, I don't, I don't talk to a lot of the big art streamers, but it's there if you want it. And that having that openness and space to put your own stuff out there 
eliminates a barrier that I had found in other places. And it is free. That's the beautiful <laughs> part. It is really hard to do stuff as an artist sometimes because not a lot of the art things are free. So having that space and that openness has been huge. Cool. Um, so when you started then, sorry to give a follow up, but like it made me think of something that like when you started streaming art was a niche yes. and now how do you find your niche within that space after having started this and now it's like a thing that you're involved in, you know? Uh, so it, it started off very much as a utility thing. Uh, we were going into quarantine and I teach at a lot of different places. I teach at art centers, I teach at libraries. I do a lot of just fun, specific art things. And we were in lockdown and I couldn't do that. So I wanted a way to connect with my students and I will forever and always be a huge fan of Bob Ross. And I love the fact that you could literally turn on Bob Ross and just paint along or not and just listen to his dulcet tones and be <laughs> so zen because he's amazing. So, you know, <laughs> lofty goals, but that was what I wanted. I wanted a space where my students could find me and we could just draw and I would put out, you know, I made a couple of user accounts where people could log in and talk to me if, if they didn't want their own Twitch profile, if they were students, because some of them are younger people. You don't want to have to live in that world. Here's a way that I can facilitate you coming to me in that. What I then found was I really like this aspect of it. All of a sudden, this has captured for me the feeling of being at Comic-Con, which I'm not doing for two years. So it evolved into this I can now make the art that I want and make the specific art community that I want through this platform that I've already, I went through the rough patch of figuring it out. And now I can be like, hey, a whole bunch of my friends who didn't stream before, you should come and stream with me and we should all do art live on the internet. And they're like, okay. And so it grew from there, <laughs> which was awesome. Cool, awesome. Cool. Uh, Channing, something that you mentioned at the start of your intro really kind of like, uh, caught me as like a another layer of this conversation right uh around finding a niche and it's not just in an online space it's not just uh creating art it's not just uh making things for people to consume right like can you talk a little bit about finding a niche in your community and kind of what that what that can look like oh this was gonna be tough because um <laughs> I would like to say that I started, well, I shouldn't, I did not start it myself, but I, I shouldn't say that I co-founded the Black Geeks of Dragon Con because I immediately thought, oh, black people need a space. I want to be the Martin Luther King, <laughs> Malcolm X of, of nerds. Black cosplay. That was not the case. Um, it actually started as a joke. I went to my first Dragon Con in 2008. And when I came home, I just posted some photos and someone asked, were you the only black person there? Because th this was at a time when it was not really a thing. Black sure. people being into sci-fi, much less going to conventions. And I literally, as a joke, went through the photos that I took, found all the ones of cosplayers of color, made a gallery, and I called it proof that I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> and posted it to Facebook. And then I posted it to a couple of um, Facebook groups dealing with Dragon Con. And honestly, they were overwhelmingly popular. Yeah, um, hell yeah, God bless Dragon Con. You guys are great. Um, there were a handful of negative comments, but every and then that just grew. And then it started just me kind of like, Oh, black cosplayer, let me chase them down and go take their <laughs> picture. Then it became, Oh, let's host the photo shoot. Then it became, Let's start this community. And the community was never to segregate ourselves. Um, I know this is a bad term, but it was in a way to create a safe space. It was to create a space where if a black cosplayer said, Hey, here's my Superman cosplay, what do you all think? The first comment that they receive wouldn't be bleach your skin. <laughs> it was to build a community where if a woman says, hey, a plus size woman says, hey, here's my Wonder Woman cosplay, what do you think about it? The first comment wouldn't be go eat a salad. Mm. So it wasn't to try to have this pro-black white people or evil space. It was a place to get a space where people could get honest feedback about things. It was a place where people could share projects they were working on without being called woke <laughs> or anything like that. And then it just kind of expanded. But my initial thought for the community was that it was just going to be a group of people who got together, 
one time a year to take a photo on the back photo, steps. Yeah. <laughs> and it has just grown because of that. And I've kind of had to grow with it. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah. It, like it's a reminder, right. To everyone that, that is making art in digital spaces that like, there are people on the other side of the screen. Right. Um, and like, it's okay for the stuff that you do in your niche communities to like bleed out into the real world. And there's so much benefit in that. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. I think that one of the things I love about your story is that it shows that you can start in a very small niche and then build it because it exists now. Yeah. yeah. And so you, you've taken something that didn't exist or didn't exist formally and, and given it form. Yeah. So that other people can join you, so that you've given other people a space to celebrate and come together, and and I think that that's super powerful, particularly in this case. Yes, thank you, thank you. Speaking of small communities and small niches, uh, this question, <laughs> <laughs> this question is for Steph. Um, Felt it coming. So Shakespeare podcasts. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's the whole What's question. question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there's a show that I really like, and it's called Not Another Shakespeare Podcast. And I was telling Mike about it, and he's like, are there really that many Shakespeare podcasts that you need to call yourself <laughs> Not Another One? Because we all know, like, Not Another D&D Podcast that, that makes sense. Yeah, like, I mean, if you have met someone that looks like me, they have a D&D show, right? Like, <laughs> or two. <laughs> I do mine and my friends. Right. <laughs> um, I love D&D. If someone would invite me on their show for a live play, Yo, Channel, shot, please uh, call me. Yep. I've never Let me slide you a card. Yeah, I can't throw a card that far, but I can pass it down the end of the table. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, continue. Sorry. <laughs> no, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so it's it's a pretty small community. There are not a ton of Shakespeare podcasts, but that's because there aren't a ton of Shakespeare podcast listeners. The audience is much smaller uh, than D and D, which is much more mainstream. Who can imagine uh, anyone growing up in the eighties can't imagine right. that yeah. half like being a thing that's true. Um, so I I still wanted though to set myself apart from that community because like I said it's a lot of summary podcasts and that's awesome and I could make a very funny summary podcast but I didn't want to just add to the noise even when the noise is at a much lower volume than something like D and D I still wanted to make sure that I was on just a different frequency. Cool and so how did you land on your frequency specifically? Oh, um, so like Shakespeare podcasting, uh, specifically this like improvised version of like, yeah. So basically, on my podcast, I have a new guest every week, and they pick both sides of the argument. So the topic is um, who would be the best Marvel superhero, and my guest comes on and says, "I'm going to argue for for um, uh, Henry the Fifth, and you are going to argue for Hamlet," and I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> And so for me, it's improv and I have to justify why that would be a good choice. And the reason that I landed on that is, is honestly because I didn't have time to prepare. I didn't want to. I was already doing the work to get a guest every week. I've done 15, 20 years of preparation of learning all of the plays and knowing a lot about them, improv training and all of that. So I've done I've done my prep, um, but I was a teacher, I was a public high school teacher, and I did not have time to make notes and, and make it um, thoughtful and, and precise. I just didn't have the time or energy. So doing it improv based where the guest does all the work, <laughs> um, you know, they have their, their argument, they give me a character and I just get to have fun. And we, I love yelling. I love showing that Shakespeare can be something that you're passionate and silly about. So that's kind of how it all came together. Uh, to be what it, what it is. <laughs> awesome. Uh, audience, when you have a question, step up to the mic and we will get to you. Uh, I'm going to run through random questions that I wrote down that I thought might be interesting to a general audience, but like we want to know specifically what y'all want to know uh, kind of about this. Uh, but I did want to say, Steph, you said the magic word for me. Uh, which was fun. <laughs> um, it like it took us a little bit to get there, uh, but like I heard it, and I just want to call that out that like 
the reason I do Tiger Beat soccer podcast called Swoon Tower Soccer is because it's fun to me. I want to look at their social media and talk about, like, yo, did you see they were out to dinner together? Like, I never would have guessed that. They don't even speak the same language. Like, what's that going on? You know, like, that's the, the silly stuff to me that I really like. Um, and so that's what keeps me doing it. <laughs> uh, one of the questions here that I wrote down that maybe y'all have and, and haven't an, like wanted to ask yet, uh, is there anything you wish you knew before starting down this path about your, your niche space? Uh, and anyone feel free to. I wish before I had started writing, I had not started with a nine book epic fantasy series. <laughs> so, but no, seriously, it's I'll, I see all these book talk people that they crank out like a book a month. They have all these standalones and I'm here writing this giant epic series. That's like my first thing that I did. And I don't have new books to be talking about all the time. So I kind of wish that I had sprinkled in some smaller stuff along the way instead of just biting off this giant thing to start with. Yeah. Uh, I think I think when I started off, um, it was it was interesting to me to watch how easy it is to start in a niche that you think you're going to just love and want to stay in forever, but then find yourself like a little burnt out on it. Sure. And I think that this is this applies to everyone. I think anyone that's been creating content for a certain amount of time will get burnt out on a specific type of content, and. I did this when I created my channel. It was the idea, let's call it Curzy Fabrication, so it was somewhat more generic, so that Just I in had case. a little <laughs> space to breathe in it. I didn't call it Chris's 3D printing channel, <laughs> in case I got tired of just doing 3D printing. And I saw that in the space. I sort of looked at the space before I started, and I saw that there were already people in that space, that 3D printing space, that I could tell were a little burnt out on it. Sure. That I could tell didn't feel like they had any room to move. And so if you're starting something new, give yourself some space to breathe. Make it in a niche so you need a niche because you have to have an audience unless you think you're going to get there on your personality alone. Which some people do, but I didn't, <laughs> I didn't expect it, so I, I went with the niche. But what I'd recommend is give yourself some breathing room so that you can stretch, so that if you get tired of doing one very specific kind of content, that you can then move adjacent sure. and take your audience with you into new things that you enjoy, and hopefully they'll go with you. I think specifically to that, too, is, and this was something that was very difficult for me, in starting out, it's very easy to compare yourself to another niche person who does what you do. Um, sometimes artists are really hard on ourselves when we compare our art to other people. It's what? Weird. Ah, artists? We do? It's so <laughs> weird. Uh, so it's hard. It's hard in doing that to not immediately compare yourself to someone else who has been doing it longer or who already had a bigger following before they start doing that. But I think like you were saying, giving yourself the space to then pivot to something that is adjacent to it or finding your specific part of it that brings you joy is really important because I needed that push. I needed yeah. to look up to other people, see what they were doing and be inspired by them and realize then parts of this work great for me, but other parts don't. I, you know, I, I don't <laughs> think I can rely just on my personality or just on my art skills, but here are things that I can bring to the table that are uniquely mine and are uniquely interesting to my viewers. And so that was very important to me to keep that in mind that I don't have to be any other type of artist. I can just be the artist that I am and people will enjoy that. Yep. Yep. Yes. And Great. just to kind of tack on to that, um, it's fine to compare yourself to other people up to a point. You know, it's one <laughs> thing to say, okay, what are they offering that I'm not, that I might be able to add on, but eventually you're gonna get stuck in your own head. And <laughs> next thing you know, the podcast that you thought you'd be starting in a month, you're not starting it for another four or five years. You kind of get stuck in your own headspace. Uh, that was my issue. I, I was like, okay, there are roughly a billion podcasts out there. What is adding mine going to do? So, you know, it's fine to look for like, as a competitive analysis kind of thing. Yes. But you definitely don't want to start doing, oh, they're doing this better than me. Maybe I should wait. Sure. Oh, they've got a $500 microphone that I can't afford right now. Yeah. Maybe I should wait. Or not do it. Maybe. <laughs> right. Or not do it. Yeah. yeah. All um, right. The thing, real quick, the thing that I would say is make sure as you're giving yourself space um, that you understand that it still comes back on you. I decided to do 
a different guest on my show every single week. And I've had a different guest on my show every week for two years. And in a very small community, it's very hard to find a, di a different person every week. <laughs> Um, and to let yourself reevaluate things, um, not just in your content, but in your structure as well, to go easy on yourself that you can change things like the entire format of your show if you need to on a dime. Sorry. I'm, is it okay if I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. don't yeah. apologize. Uh, um, so jumping off of your question, you were talking about moving into a niche that's adjacent. What do you do when you're like, Channing and you have so many interests um like i have a wine podcast but i also have an adventure time podcast so uh what's I, your what's your wine podcast called i don't it's not ready don't oh, okay. Okay. what's Do your adventure follow me what's your adventure time podcast called <laughs> not also ready. not <laughs> sorry i'm i'm not ready to release okay okay, okay. That's, that's fine, fine. Um, their works in progress okay um excuse my voice i guess i'm nervous um <laughs> what do you do when you're your niches aren't adjacent <laughs> to each other? Um, and how do you kind of bridge that gap and then Great build question. two very separate communities? Fantastic question. I, I think you build two communities. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah yes. honestly, it's, same. You need to decide, are you are you focusing on your niches and the people in those, those niches? Or are you focusing on yourself and you would like to draw those two together? Um, I think that starting out, if I were doing it, I would keep them separate. I would do this podcast and find out where it takes me and do this podcast and find out where it takes me. And you may find out that one of those holds your passion more than the other. And you decide to, to stay there, or you may decide that I need a suite of podcasts and I have three other podcast ideas <laughs> I and I need to start those. I'm working on this. Well. <laughs> yeah. see, see what I'm saying? And so you need to decide number one, what are your passions? How are you going to distribute yourself amongst those passions? Um, and I think if people fall in love with you, they will follow you to your other interests because they'll go, ah, oh, they have a network and I'm yeah. going to follow them on whatever they do because I enjoy them so much. A hundred percent. Yeah, sure is on my likability. <laughs> <laughs> as, as someone who has a bunch of different things in a bunch of different spaces, soccer, D&D &D, and Shakespeare and other stuff, like <laughs> um, make sure that you know who you are as a brand even if you don't do a great job of branding yourself before your show. <laughs> um, <laughs> my brand is wholesome niche nerd content. And so even if people cross over to my other shows, I'm not like super vulgar on this show and then like really wholesome on another one. You have a brand and voice consistency. And then, yeah, your audience might cross over more than you would expect. And then you still have that kind of guidepost for you as a human. Plus, to so, that, I'm so sorry. Oh, uh, there is authenticity to your passion. And you, if you are excited to talk about these things, like I also, I work at a winery. I love talking about wine. It doesn't have anything else to do with any of other of my nerd stuff. But I find nerd people in that space. And so your passion is what the people will show up for. And so I think as well, like, I don't always feel confident in my likability, but I'm pretty sure that I'm entertaining when I talk about <laughs> these things that I like. Uh, so that's that's the most important thing with that, is if you are excited about it, your audience will hear that excitement and they'll be excited with you. And as someone who does have different facets of, you know, wholesome art for the children and then after dark art, <laughs> I don't always want my communities to cross over and that's okay you can still appreciate me for the art that i make in whichever stream you tune into yeah and just adding on to that really quickly as an author i have a lot of author friends who write under multiple pen names and they build mm. separate brands that are Smart. completely separated from each other i have one friend for example who writes really scientific sci-fi stuff under one pen name and then the other pen name is really smutty romance and they don't <laughs> cross over at all with the audience really i mean i'm sure some people would read both but they keep their names completely separate and they don't let anyone even know that it's the same it's more work but they have been able to build separate brands and keep both of them going I will, I will say that from an algorithm perspective, since we <laughs> talked about the algorithm, um, yes, you yes. can either not care about it or you can care about it, but you do need to decide at some point <laughs> yeah. upset yourself constantly throughout the process. Because I've done that. I'm like, eh, I don't care, but I want people to watch me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't want to waste your resources. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. And what you'll find out about the algorithm, just sidetrack to the sidetrack, is that 
ultimately you do care if people watch you ultimately if you're going to spend the time and energy to put this content out you're going to spend time editing it and making it and prepping for it you do want people to watch you you do want people to listen to what you have to say so the algorithm unfortunately is going to matter if you want an audience so what i was going to say about that is that the algorithm will favor the niche meaning if you are making three types of content, I would have three different social media tracks for that content. This is this is my advice yeah. because that's how people find you. If you put on their D and D soccer uh, <laughs> cosplay yeah. podcaster, wow, it's going to okay. be really hard. Okay, somebody's called out here. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, yeah. honestly, uh, next panelist at it's least. It's going to be hard for people to find you. You know, yeah. and, and, and so by niching in on each of your tracks, whatever you plan on doing, it is easier for people to find you. And then it's actually easier for people to follow you because if they care about D&D, &D, but they don't care about soccer, they might not like your soccer post. That might annoy their timeline if they want their timeline to look a certain way. Yeah. So I do recommend niching in, even if then maybe there's that fourth Twitter account that <laughs> That's is your yours. name. Yeah. That is who you are, and that represents you as a person rather than all of these sub brands of you. All of this to say, though, don't be like Channing and wait four years to release your shows. Uh, they are readier than you think they are. Well, uh, why, why you gotta call me out? <laughs> I was feeling attacked. I had to, you know, like you I got, I got like nervous. That, like, no, <laughs> two years ago it. we were yelling. Release your show. Yeah. yeah uh, you this year, we're yelling, release your show. As, as a, yeah. as a person, I do regret it. <laughs> and as a person that, that follows YouTubers and podcasters and stuff, go listen to anyone's first attempts. Go listen to episode one of any show. Literally any YouTube, show. Oh, my YouTube God. Any show. Or, 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 <laughs> I mean, particularly if they were new to whatever medium that they were following at the time, go listen to it. Except yeah. mine. Don't go back on my TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> because you will see the rawness in what they're putting out. You will see their hesitancy in what they're doing. You will see the unrefinement that you've come to love about them. And this is from everyone from the best podcaster to the best YouTuber. Go watch Mr. Beast's first video. It's still on his channel. That kind of thing is still available. Thank awesome. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great question. Yeah. Great question. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, y'all. Hi there. Hi. So, uh, recently, my wife had a TikTok of me go viral. <laughs> How do you get it off the internet? Is that your question? That's not what this panel is about. <laughs> was, was this on TikTok or OnlyFans? <laughs> it was on TikTok. I've it's seen fully, the TikTok. Fully <laughs> um, but because of that, we now have the ability to go live. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, prior to this, she's had her own thing that she's done on TikTok, not related to to what we do. We're both music streamers, and is it is it like dishonest of us if we start to kind of pivot her account over to that? Because we have another account where we do that sort of thing. It just didn't get that traction, and now we have a potential audience there. And is that like is that I cheeky? I think that's fine. I yeah. You have to get a thousand followers on TikTok in order to be able to go live. And yeah. um, as soon as I got that, I started going live. And I do all different kinds of lives. I'll have um, sometimes another author will come on and we'll have a conversation, or I'll do a Q and A with audience. Sometimes we don't even talk about writing. And um, it's uh, but with TikTok, it you do tend to sort of niche down into what you're talking about. Like for me, it's writing and publishing and that kind of thing. But it's a lot more about authenticity of the person presenting, and it's your personality yes. that goes out there. So if it's as long as it's authentic content, that it's what you are all about and what you're presenting, I don't think it's cheating. I think it's just another aspect of yourself that you're showing to the viewers and that you're showing to your audience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as yeah. someone who is recently married, I think my best advice would be uh, to ask your wife if that's what she wants to do with her TikTok uh, <laughs> and let her make that decision uh, and you support it. Uh, but like, I know you, Jake, uh, and so I know that that's a thing. Uh, that conversation has already yeah started. exactly exactly but, uh, but you'll also find out whether the audience wants it right. if you go live 
on your wife's TikTok and nobody watches it, I think you found your answer. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do it without her. <laughs> together, so, but, yeah. but you see what I'm saying. And, yeah. and your audience will decide whether that's worth your time. And one interesting yeah. thing about going live on TikTok is it shows it not just to your followers. I, I get a lot more people who don't follow me that watch my lives, and I pick up a lot of followers that way. So the you might too. actually pivot your audience by doing lives in that way. And I think knowing you, notes. so it's a little bit of an in on this answer and question, but you are incredibly authentic and that is admirable and watchable. Like I, that honesty is what I want. So even if I had started, you know, I was like, oh, I saw this funny thing and I followed. If you came on and said, hey, this is what I want to talk about today. That resonates with me. And I think it resonates with a lot of other people. So at the end of the day, just being honest, they're like, this is what I would like to create. And I think that's valuable. Awesome. Like I play piano on TikTok sometimes. It has nothing to do with writing and my <laughs> followers like it. So, I mean, go yes. for it. I'm cool. looking for you now. Right. <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> Power line. Yeah. Hey there. Yes, hi. Um, I have this niche that I'm not really sure I, um, I excel at, uh, I don't okay. know if we could play video, but I have this tag called uh, do over D U O V E R. It's like a Kelp Carper karaoke cover, uh, voiceover cover kind of thing. Uh, and the best two, I could say, uh, Jack's Lament and when love takes over, uh, when I send the links or the, uh, SoundCloud, uh, audio they don't give me any feedback or encouragement or criticism or reaction or anything like to your friends and yeah uh tell them you want that is like i mean have you sent it to them asking for feedback and they've ignored it yeah okay I, and did you say these are your friends or are they other people in the space friends friends um one thing i'll tell you and i worked um in journal online journalism for 10 years and one thing i've learned from users and it kind of applies to friends people are quicker to um criticize than they are to compliment so sometimes silence is there was nothing wrong with this or it was fine sure yeah usually if someone That's does not point. like something they'll they let you know on the trigger yeah <laughs> yeah whereas if somebody likes something they'll just keep going along with it so I can't tell you 100% that that's the case, but mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of cases yeah. like that. Yeah, I think uh, as a as someone who is like made art that I'm not sure what the like reception is on it, right? Uh, I will ask very pointed questions of the people who like, hey, uh, would would you do me a favor and listen to this thing mm -hmm. that I'm doing? Once I get the yes, okay, cool. Also, will you tell me? what you liked about it, what you wished you, yeah. you could have seen. Uh, there, there are a couple of different like structures for that, right? There's stars and wishes, there's a uh, rosebud thorn. There's like a few different structures, right? Of like, uh, this is something I really liked and this is something that I wish had happened. This is something that I see as potential or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And so giving people a little bit of structure and letting them know that you're open to that could help that conversation along. Mm -hmm. uh, also, sometimes people just, don't want to say anything because they're like mm -hmm. afraid of they don't know how much criticism you really want do you do you want to hear that it was fantastic or do you want to hear <laughs> that uh you were not quite what hey, i mean you were pitchy uh, like <laughs> yeah. it doesn't matter it, it, well and, and to you it may not matter to you you may legitimately want that feedback um but that doesn't mean you know People that don't mm -hmm. always feel comfortable giving legitimate mm -hmm. feedback. Strangers are right. typically more comfortable giving. Honest <laughs> yeah, yeah, honestly, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you would be better off to find people that you're on. <laughs> like that you barely know on yeah. Twitter yeah. and send yeah. this to them and say, "What do you think about this?" And like that's this what I was thinking as far as a specific community. So if there were other artists that you looked up to, even if they're not doing obviously exactly what you're doing, but the community that they're a part of, where part of the conversation is we are going to talk about the goods and the bads of this piece. You know, mm. there are, it's something I love about the art space is there are communities that are just for, Hey, I'd love to post some fan art. And that's the guideline of the community. And there's mm. other communities where it's, we are going to have a very serious conversation about the good and the bad, the technical aspects of this art. Mm. And if I'm having a bad art day, 
I don't take a piece that I think is rough and put it up there to have everybody <laughs> be very honest with me. But if I'm trying to grow and I'm trying to get feedback from the people who are doing the same type of stuff or have technical expertise, I want to hear what they have to say. So it, and again, seeking out strangers who have knowledge in different places than a lot of my friends, because a lot of my friends aren't artists. Mm -hmm. So finding a space for that type of conversation can be very beneficial. And ideally, best case scenario, then you find people who are like, hey, this thing you're doing is really cool. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. Yeah, or right. let's collaborate. Or let's right? collaborate. Like, I honestly yeah. don't think friends and family are the best judges of, of you. They know you. They mm -hmm. are used to you. And so particularly if you're stepping outside of your normal self, Mm -hmm. to do something creative they're not really going to know what to think about it they already know <laughs> your voice they already know who you are and so it may seem uncharacteristic for yeah. them and feel awkward to them mm -hmm. whereas if you show it to a stranger they don't know you they mm -hmm. don't know what to expect from you and i think that they're a little bit more unbiased yeah, yeah. yeah. when i was a teenager uh <laughs> my mom told me one of the Biggest lie she's ever told me, <laughs> even worse than the one about Santa Claus that we won't reveal. Mm. <laughs> uh, my mom looked me dead in the eye and said, you can dance. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't. I was worried about going to a party. I cannot dance. I'm one of those rare black people when they were handing out rhythm. They said, you know what? We're going to give you the web development skill. <laughs> so, so, yeah, to their point, um, sometimes either they know you too well and they can't, but also sometimes people don't feel like they're qualified to mm. give feedback. Mm. You know, if I have a friend who's a doctor, if they said, hey, what did you think of this surgery I did? <laughs> Good job. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, they didn't die. That's yeah. not all, all I can tell them. So it could be that maybe some of your friends just don't feel like they're qualified to truly say, oh, that audio quality wasn't right, or you mm -hmm. asked too many open-ended questions. So, yeah, <laughs> that could be it, too. Yeah. Okay. Great just, question. Two small though. questions. Uh, the the do-over is a, a combination of duet and cover. You, is that something that might catch on or sounds catchy? Um, to me, if we're looking for honest feedback, it sounds, I hear too much of do-over, D-O, dash, O-V-E-R. Um, mm -hmm. I think that if it's something that you brand really strongly, anything can catch on. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you will have to do a lot of work on the back end to make it clear what that is. Uh, yeah, it, re oh, it reminds me of uh, that movie, uh, That Thing You Do, when they wanted to name themselves The Wonders, but they spelled it O-Needers. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. uh, and so like, that's the pitfall. Uh, mm -hmm. I really like the pun name, uh, yeah. but I am not uh, the it majority. Takes a little, it'll take yeah. a little more work, yeah. but yeah. I think like, it's fantastic. Like it. But mm -hmm. you yeah. have to sell it. And you have to figure <laughs> out how how are people going to put what I'm doing with those words. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, should I brand myself as an indie artist? Mm. I, uh, there was a legal I panel, right? I was gonna say Channing had a legal panel, right? Yes, there was. Um, it's on demand, but I'm not a lawyer, so <laughs> there, there were three people on there. One was a lawyer, I am not one of them, so I don't want to, yeah, I don't know, advice. I don't know what the legal uh stuff is around covers and fair use and all of that. Uh, especially if you're going to try and make money off it, uh, I would recommend talking to somebody who does know. Uh, yeah. so <laughs> great well, question, thank you, though, thank you, real good. Hi. Hi. Cool. Hi there. So kind of talking about uh, diversifying your content to being able to allow you to pivot when you need to, and also kind of talking about what Channing was saying earlier about what do I add to the sphere? Uh, I, I use a stream, going to start it back up again, uh, primarily comp like ranked and competitive gameplay and like challenge gameplay for the games I like. It's a, it's a very specific niche, but it's one that a lot of people view. How do you not drown in that? How do you <laughs> still do the content that you want, but still stand out? Mm. So uh, I do, I, I just want to hop in real quick because I heard him ask a question in another panel uh, about 
uh, working in a toxic space and maintaining positivity. And honestly, that's a differentiator, right? Uh, the League of Legends community uh, is <laughs> uh, famous, uh, infamous, whatever the word is that you want to use uh, for a lot of things. And uh, more positive voices in that type of community uh, are always needed. Um, and knowing the 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 person that that you are from the questions that you've asked the rest of the weekend uh that's like for yeah just number following one. him around show to show like, uh, well no we just, just, <laughs> that, that's how it's been like we've yeah. ended up at so many panels together all, all weekend because dragon con is amazing uh well, let's be yeah. honest you're your brand right yeah. what's going to differentiate you from any other streamer is you and what you bring to the content the only reason that someone watches my YouTube channel about an XYZ printer versus Bob's XYZ printer channel is purely on what I brought that was different than what he brought. And they may watch both, which is commonly going to happen across any niche. Yes. Is they're not just going to watch you or just watch this other guy or just watch the top streamer in that, but they're going to add you to that list because they like you. They trust you. They feel comfortable when you stream. So it, it's really you that you're bringing. And, and that's the only differentiator I think any of us can bring. And let me say real quick, the positivity thing is a very powerful differentiator because I use that in my presentation as well. On my TikTok bio, my bio says, be kind, be generous, and have empathy. And that's what I try to put into all of my content that I put out. And I have brought in a lot of followers and have gotten a really good community based around that concept. So the positivity is a really powerful thing that you can bring. Some people are looking for safe spaces, particularly yes. if they love something and can't find a safe space Yes. in that something yep i mean we heard it from channing and in, in real life as well uh yeah. and yeah. so like real life and the internet are more and more the same place yeah so now you need to find other ways to project yourself meaning like you have to find ways that people can find you <laughs> and that's hard and that's a whole nother panel yeah mm -hmm. but the only thing you can bring to your streams is yourself and that's what i recommend is that if you if you're going for positivity if you're going for changing up a narrative that a community is bringing then, you know, that's what you're going to bring. So, something silly. And again, I always think in the art terms, I was like, okay, so how would I, you know, specifically design a logo that was eye catching for you? But along those lines, so it is so much your personality. So, because you're doing a ranking thing, what's a very silly or fun or serious, however you want to do it, way that you give out your certain rankings? Is it, you know, number of this thing that is your own personal ranking system. So again, it's still building off of you, but it's it's now something that people can be like, oh, wow, you know, I tuned into this guy because he gave me, you know, he's like eight burritos out of 10, which means it's really, really good. <laughs> but it's, it's something silly. And if it works for you, it can feed into that part of it. But then there's a, here's a specific framework for how my ranking system that is nothing new, but how it stands out because here's how I choose to rank games. Here's, you know, I'm going to rate all of these normal things, but I'm also going to rate, you know, how clear was the barcode on the back of the box printed? <laughs> like, it doesn't matter, but it's something silly and someone might be like, oh, that's really funny. I'm going to check it out because I've never seen that before. Or, and it's just, again, it's those little things. It's a little hook. I can draw the same, I can draw Deadpool just like everybody else does. But, you know, I'm going to try and find something that's silly or something that's different. That is, here is a swan named Emily's version of Deadpool and somebody what had their eye caught by that and that's why they clicked on it awesome all right thank you mm -hmm. all right i think we're gonna call it after these two questions uh and then we'll do some wrap up and uh, plugs and all of that uh so hi um so my issue is much like channing i'm very nervous to start my channel i'm wanting to start a twitch channel for gaming <laughs> but twitch and gaming it's already it's there and I know I can distinguish myself like as a female streamer, but I'm also kind of a jack of all trades in lots of different areas. And part of my thing is I want to interact both with other streamers and with my audience more so than just in a chat way. So when starting off, it's really hard to find those people to work with and good audience members to work with. So how do you deal with that interaction? How do you find those people Such and facilitate question. that? Be the be the person that you want to interact with. Um, that's I don't have much to say. That's <laughs> yeah. that's groundbreaking. But if you project positivity and wholesome and whatever, whatever, 
you will find people who are gravitated towards that. And it will likely be a very slow build uh, because we all know it's a grind and, and things don't just explode most of the time. And so if you're putting out what you want, then you'll attract it. And, and I absolutely recommend, and this is whether you're streaming or just in life in general, don't be afraid to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. Like, what's the worst that's going to happen if you send an email to this streamer and say, do you want to stream with me? Do you want to play a game together? Yeah. The yeah. worst thing that's probably going to happen to you, you're just not going to get a reply. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What could happen is they're going to go, sure, when do you want to do it? Yeah. And so even, I mean, if you frequently watch Twitch and you've got a name of 20 different streamers you'd like to work with, send them emails, send them messages, find out the best way to reach them that's not just in the chat while they're streaming. You know, yeah. reach out to them as another streamer. Say, this is what I'm trying to do. This is, and also with any collaboration that you're doing online, have a plan. Don't just go, <laughs> I want to work with you, but say, I want to build this content. I think yeah. you're the right person for this content. Can Are you available this Thursday or next Thursday at six o'clock? Like come up with the plan, tell them why you're, what you're doing and why it's special and then see who replies to you. Honestly, that might be Channing's biggest fear is that someone says yes and then he has to. Yes, <laughs> like, I to do it. Oh, no. Honestly, there's some truth to that. Um, <laughs> just to jump in real quick, there are also, going back to niche groups, there are several organizations and groups that yes. are about women in gaming, be it playing games, developing games, voiceover in games. Reach out to them, share some of your content in there, and they're going to give you good feedback. It's going to be a place that won't be as toxic and that's going to build up your confidence um i think that's just also kind of a good way to get started and find some of those partnerships find a tribe yeah because yes. what that tribe yeah. is also going to do when you're um streaming and some misogynist comes in and starts <laughs> you know trying to ruin things that tribe will come in they will yeah. be your auto moderators for yeah. you they will be those people to knock out the negative voices and they'll overpower it and that's always been my thing. The negative voices were always way more loud than the positive voices. Yeah. So I have, it's good to have people that'll raid your stream at the end of this. Stream. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 it's wonderful. I have Charles McFall's voice in the back of my head, and I swear if I don't do this, he will find me. Yes. <laughs> Join the Dragon Con Digital Media Tracks Discord channel. Yeah. Uh, post your stuff and like hit any of us up. Yeah. You have already found the place to meet creators that want to big you up. Uh, you're here right now. You're in the room. You're at the panel. You're at the con. Uh, this is the space. Yeah. You, you're doing it. Yeah. And adding on to that, just some encouragement uh, through TikTok, which is what I do. There's a lot of uh, collaboration through lives on there. And people have reached out to me to ask if I would do a live with a new author or something like that. I've never turned down uh, someone because their account was too small or because they were too new. The only reason I've ever turned anyone down is because I just didn't have the time in my schedule to do it. So uh, people, even like people way bigger than uh, you would imagine, uh, will want to work with you and want to help and want to do things with you as long as they have the time to do it. So just be encouraged by that. You also add content to their content by working with them. You're adding something new. And most content creators, particularly if we've been doing it long enough, are always looking for new ideas. And so if someone wants to come in and help us, then yeah. it's good for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more. My question is kind of on like a bigger topic, but how do you find, um, how do you find the thing that makes your thing profitable? <laughs> if you figure it out, will you let me know? Yeah. You can do uh, your there, own panel for that. Right? Right. The room will be packed. Uh, there was a panel earlier today called Funding Your Hobby, How to Raise Money Without Being a Jerk. Uh, that had some good ideas. It, it depends greatly on your niche, though. Like, I have to be honest, in my niche, it's not too hard because I'm niched down into a product. And I if like you, you need the hair and, flip after that, right? <laughs> yeah. no. okay. Listen, if, I'm if rich you, now because of you too. No, right? <laughs> it up. Um, no, but if you if you can find and and I and to segue from me being so filthy rich, <laughs> um, if you can find the products and services associated with what you're interested in, that's who you reach out to because now you are providing a very direct line to those markets 
to the people they're trying to reach. And those people are very happy typically to reach a thousand people. If, if you only have a thousand followers or whatever it is that are interested in that one thing yeah. so specifically. All right. so that's what you're looking for. We are at one minute left. So we're going to go down the end, starting with Channing this way. Uh, everybody give where people can find you and Channing specifically uh, from the chat. Also give us your release date. <laughs> Oh, we're going to make this um, Twitch yep. official. Uh, DC Digital Media exclusive. When's the release date, Channing? <laughs> okay, so you can find me on, on Instagram and Twitter at Channing Sherman, my actual government name. As far as the release date, I am shooting for November. November. I actually have three episodes recorded. I just need to get them edited. And I believe in paying people for their work. So I'm going to wait for my bank account to recover from Dragon Con. Channing, my birthday is posted. November 5th. I want to I want to release on November 5th. <laughs> you Can you do that for me? Wait, what? Is November 5th. <laughs> oh, I, I see. November 5th? Now. Yeah. You know what? November 5th is good. Let's go! November 5th. Hashtag November 5th. Hashtag Sherman Cut. <laughs> uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I am Swan. I'm a Swan named Emily. All across the internet, you can go to a swannamedemily.com. That has all of my stuff. Follow me on Twitch. Come chat with me about art or about anything. Uh, I'll also say to the quick question that you had earlier, um, I make art in a whole bunch of different ways. So I am profitable in different ways, not just in the specific niche of streaming on Twitch. So you can still utilize the thing that you're doing for all that other stuff. But yeah, come chat with me. Wow. I am Jason Duro, and uh, my website is just myname.com. It's right here. And on TikTok, which is my primary social media, I'm Jason Duro author. So you can follow me on there. I have a link tree that's linked from there. You can find my uh, writing on uh, Amazon or in bookstores, wherever you find them. And uh, feel free, anyone who is interested in writing or publishing, self-publishing especially, to reach out to me. I always enjoy helping. If anybody wants to come up and talk to me afterwards, I have my business card and would be happy to help with any of that. And uh, follow me on TikTok and uh, interact with me. I'll be happy to meet any of you. So. I am Stephanie Crignola. You can find me, everyone besides Chris can find me at Kruggles on Twitter because <laughs> that filters all of the things I do into one place. So if you hate variety, <laughs> if you don't follow me there, you can find my different shows. I knew shows I was going to get in trouble somehow. <laughs> um, Curzy Fabrications on YouTube, Curzy Fabs everywhere else. I do making, I do 3D printing primarily, but I am trying to go more into cosplay and electronics, and I'm a software developer by trade, so that lets me stretch my wings a little bit into what I really enjoy doing. If you want some uh, stickers and swag and stuff, I have some, or there's some on the back table, or if you want to talk about make free stuff, hit me up. I am Mike Crignola. I've been your moderator. You can find me at Future X Skeleton, because one day I'm going to die. Thank you so much. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your Dragon Con. Way to end on a high note. <laughs> <laughs>